fact, I thought uh, before I uh, introduce the speaker, let's give a, a round of applause for our president. That was wonderful. <laughs> that Sona speech was like a, a Mandela moment, you know, where we all lifted up and our spirit are, are there and the challenges uh, uh, that we're facing in this country sort of diminished a little bit. But uh, I thought uh, we will use this ULP to talk a little bit about Tumamina because the ethos of ULP is about not a sense of entitlement, is a sense of what is it that I can do for South Africa, not what the government should do for me. And uh, so, Brahu actually says, sings this song and says, I want to be there when people start to turn it around and our country is turning around. Last time I said in three months time, what has changed in this country is about leadership. I want to be there when they triumph up over poverty. We've got people through ULP here. Uh, where's Andy Lee? I haven't seen him, but I'll introduce him from Windmill Park. And we have a, a poverty uh, program that we're running there. So I want to en encourage you, if you are saying to Mamina and you really want to uh, uh, lend a hand uh, through the work that we're doing, you're welcome, particularly fighting poverty. Uh, also, I want to be there when people win battle against HIV. Uh, please. Uh, there's a lot of people who are still suffering from this disease. And I think if you are here and you're coming from health profession, particularly here, and you're part of the ULP team, we want you to come to us. We will make sure that you, we connect you with the right people. I want to be there and I want to lend a hand. And I want to be there for the alcoholic, particularly drugs. Uh, we've got a program, we're working in Gatle Home uh, with uh, uh, Joshua Taniello and he's very passionate about young boys. And uh, he tells me, Nyaupe takes a young boy who's a graduate, who's smart, who's in handsome, and within a month or two, that young boy is stealing everything. Uh, even the parents don't want him to come in the house in order to feed this. He's still a TV, he's still, a, still anything, furniture, anything just to sell it. And then, and then it wiped them out. And you see somebody going there. So if you are here and you say, I want to be involved in helping the drug addicts in this country, uh, and, and then lend a hand, uh, come and talk to me after this. I will link you with the program that we're working with. Victims of violence and abuse, that's all men particularly, uh, not uh, uh, use our dominance particularly over uh, women and fight violence in our country. I think we're on a trajectory that is going up. So all the negative things that were happening in our country uh, are seeming to be moving away. But let's not be complacent. Let's all say we're going to lend a hand. Am I hearing somebody say, Tumamina? <laughs> Just raise up your hand. Tumamina? <laughs> yeah, I can see all the hands here. If you are a ULP, you're coming here, the only thing that you can do is to make sure that you, co you contribute towards Tumamina. Uh, now, let me introduce our speaker. Let me first acknowledge, I can see a lot of good friends of mine here uh, that are here, and I acknowledge all of, all of you. Let me say all protocol observed. Uh, Mr. Mtet, have you got it on the screen there? He's a group chief uh, executive of Altron, and I had a good chat with him because Altron has been a family business for many years, and he was telling me uh, the transition which is happening. So he's, it's great to see from a family business becoming a professional business, and he's leading the charge. But he's been in this field of techno technology, IT, telecommunications. He's been a chief executive officer of MTN South Africa. He's also been a chief group, chief enterprise officer. I asked him, what does enterprise officer? He told me that there's two sections of, of any camp of the company like MTN. There's one that deals with consumer, and there's one that deals with, with customer. So he was looking after that business, which is a big chunk of MTN group. Uh, so he's gained a tremendous amount of leadership experience. He's been a managing director of Microsoft, 
Uh, he's been in the IBM family, uh, and uh, he grew up in that family. So you can see, that's what we do here, and the type of people we invite in ULP is people who have really worked hard, people who have uh, not uh, uh, had uh, been involved in quick risk schemes, uh, because we promote work ethic, we promote family. He's been married for 24 years uh, with one wife. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, on that note, I also remember, where's my wife? She's not here. She's outside. She's doing all the, you know. where are you? Ah, there, there she is. Hello. Hello, honey. <laughs> you still have to match up with me. I'm married for 32 years. but you, you, you'll, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> you'll get there. So that's wonderful. And he's also very, uh, uh, he's an engineer by trade, uh, for University of Natal, and then also Yale, Yale University. It's not there. So... We really appreciate you coming, and we're looking forward to hear your lessons that you've learned on leadership, and uh, we will really uh, will enjoy. So welcome him as he come up front. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair. And, uh, oh, is it Mfundis? Yeah, yeah. Is it Mfundis? Okay. <laughs> we usually call you Mfundis. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I must say that uh, on behalf of uh, myself and also my company, the company I'm working for, Altron, we are really, really honored to have been invited to come and have this discussion, this conversation with you. Uh, I've been with Altron now for 11 months. So this conversation that I'm going to be having with you, I'm going to start from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning meaning where I come from, even before I started to work. I'm going to start there. Uh, but I need to do all of that in 30 minutes. That's what Tim Funisi told me. And I'll try to do that. I come from the Eastern Cape. Uh, I'm sure some of you know this place called the Eastern Cape. Uh, it's one of the poorest regions of South Africa. Not that I'm proud of it, but I think one needs to acknowledge that. Uh, one of the most important things in any leadership is to understand reality. And you know, if, if your situation it is that situation, you need not to lie about that situation. It is what it is. You start from there. So our region is not the most popular when it comes to development. Uh, it's probably one of the leading regions when it comes to corruption, uh, very poor. Uh, I come from that environment. Uh, I come from an environment where at home there are 10 of us, 10 at home, two wives, <laughs> 10. And I'm sitting at number seven, being number seven, you clearly, as you are growing up, start to see that you are number seven. Number seven, wow. You know what? This heritage thing, it won't work for me. You know, I think that I'm going to inherit something from my dad, it won't work. Number seven, <laughs> you, you need to go figure out how, how, how you are going to make sure that you look after yourself. It became clear to me way, way back then. So, so we are, we are 10, and of course I'm number seven, and there's like six uh, ladies and, and uh, four of us. Very interesting environment because uh, my parents ended up being, uh, in fact my, my mom, she, she owned a, a little shop, she ended up being an entrepreneur, and she, if I were to look back at the person that lifted our family. The person who took our family from below, you know, poverty line to being, I would say, middle class is actually my mother. It's her decision to say, I'm going to stop teaching, going to go out there and start a shop, start a business, and through this business, I want to make sure that I educate my children. Through all of that, she worked very hard and ended up having, you know, 
not lifting only the four children that, uh, the, that she ended up ha uh, having. She also lifted every one of us, the, all of the 10 children, and including my dad in the process. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is my point here? Uh, my point is that uh, some of these things is about really making some decisions and taking uh, decisions and making choices. Uh, she took that, those, that decision. Uh, she was very, very focused around the decision she made. And when you look back, the kind of impact that she had on us, it was huge, you know. Had she not taken that one decision, who knows where we would be, you know. What I'm saying is that it all goes back to you. It all goes back to the choices that one makes. One of the things that she did was to, she was very clear about, uh, about what I would call uh, child labor, you know? you know? Using us, you know, instead of hiring people, using us to go <laughs> and do some work for her. Uh, through all of that, uh, I ended up, me and, and of course my siblings, we ended up waking up around 4.30 in the morning uh, to go fetch uh, some of the stuff so that when we open up the shop much later, when we open up the shop at 6 o'clock, we've got fresh milk, we've got bread, we've got veggies, all of the things that the customers from within the community want. But in order to have that, somebody has to wake up. And we had to wake up at our 4.30. So now some people ask me, you know, it looks like you are a, a morning person. <laughs> so I'm not so sure whether, is it because of, is it, is this how I was born, or is it because of what she, she made us to be? You know, we end up, you know, waking for me for that is like no, it's like wired. You know, I'm part of that. Uh, so that is that is me coming from uh, that environment uh, in the Eastern Cape. And sometimes when we get into companies, what we end up doing, we end up saying. Maybe let me discard, let me leave behind who I am because now I'm entering this new environment. Hmm? It's largely in the past, it was largely a white environment uh, in, in business. Uh, and I think that is a big mistake, you know, a big mistake. There is a reason why you were born where you were born. Hmm? There is a reason why you chose the parents that you chose. Uh, there's a reason why you ended up with the siblings that you have. And if you now, when you look back, when you, when you start to enter into key environments, you discard all of that, you are actually leaving behind something that is so powerful. Because who you are, your purpose in life, is linked to also the fact that you are coming from the environment that you are coming from. You have the experiences that you have, the circumstances that you ended up having. All of those are very important in terms of defining who you are. Very, very important. So I would say that when I look back, and I look back at the environment that I come from, very rural area, a very poor environment, uh, also coming from a family that was uh, very much entrepreneurial. Some of the things that I feel that that environment gave me is the whole question of uh, empathy. Of course, uh, if you are coming from uh, black families, uh, you know, this whole concept of Ubuntu, you know, uh, to me is, is something that we should not leave behind when we enter corporations. It's something that helps us connect with people, to make sure that the things that we do, they do not serve only us, but they serve others. And that's who we are. And if we decide to leave all of that at the gate as we enter the, the, the gates of the companies that we work for, I think we will be leaving something that is so powerful that can help us to be successful. Because if you look at it today, what's lacking most in the work environments is people who care, it's people who can put themselves in the shoes of others. It's the managers and leaders that get that.
And if you have that, that's something that's going to differentiate you. And it's something that is kind of like inborn. It comes, it comes just because you happen to be black in South Africa. If you leave that behind, I think you are leaving something so valuable. Coming from, my, uh, from, from the family that I come from, customer service. Something that clearly was being drummed on us, something that we continue to focus on. And it's something that is so important today. Understanding that you are there, you are not there for yourself, you are not there for your title that you are a CEO. You are there to serve the customer. That is the person that is the person that is paying everything. You need to look after the needs of that customer and make sure that you deliver the best service. A good work ethic, of course, uh, you know, waking up at 4.30, you're already, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's something that, coming from an environment where you've got, you know, already families, two families, you know, they were my dad, of course, he divorced, uh, ended up marrying my mother, and then, you know, you've got an environment that is a challenging environment. We need to accept that, that is the reality. Uh, coming from an environment like that, it's a difficult environment. As I always say that for me, I experienced discrimination within my family before I even stepped out into experiencing it in South Africa as apartheid. That's the reality of the environment that I come from. But my parents ended up helping me to address, and me and, and, and my siblings to address some of those challenges. And the good thing about what has happened now is that I'm able to manage diversity. I'm able to understand the value of diversity and able to understand the importance of inclusion. All of that comes from that environment that I come from. We may look at it and say, wow, it was a bad environment. If you look at it differently, it actually helped me. It helped me in many ways to understand how to make sure that we do not leave people behind. We include everybody as we march forward, the diversity and inclusion. Tough love, that is clearly, I mean, if you're talking about my mother, that is, it defines her. And, uh, and if you look at some of, maybe some of the people that would, uh, would talk about me, and, oh, okay, it looks nice, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's clearly something that, that I do. It's clearly something that, uh, that I feel is required. And, and they tell us, I think one of the, one of the, uh, the one of the writers once said that this world, this world that we're living in, it lacks people who love us enough to tell us the truth. Say so there are not enough people who love us enough to tell us the truth. And most of the time, that truth is so painful. And when you deliver it, it is painful. But if it's coming from the right place, you are trying to build the person, not to destroy the person. You will find that a few years later, maybe 10 years later, when people connect with you, say, wow, you actually helped me. There's so many people that you used to see what was happening around me, but they never told me this. And you helped me, and through that interaction, I was able to move to the next level. We owe each other the truth. We owe each other that level of honesty. Because it is through that that we're going to be able to make sure that we shift each other, we lift ourselves to the next level. And of course, uh, I attended a number of schools. I was, I was at St. John's College in Amtata, University of Natal, and at Yale at some point. Worked for about seven companies, Afrox, Microsoft, IBM, MTN. One of the things that I've picked up throughout all of that is that the success, how you become successful in an environment like in a school environment or a university environment, 
You cannot take that as something that the formula that you are going to be using in the next environment. It's good that you were successful, but you need to understand the new environment. When I look at, uh, at, uh, at some of the lessons for me in the transition from university to the work environment, I think for seven years, for seven years, I was so frustrated with myself. So frustrated, first year of working. You know, one of those guys that used to get, you know, top marks, A this and A that, and then you come to an environment in Afrox, it's like you are stuck. You know, you're seeing people keep going, moving ahead, and you just think you are not moving anywhere. You are asking yourself, what is the problem? And my problem, I ended up figuring it out. My problem was that I was using the formulas of the university environment in this environment. What do I mean? If you want to be successful in the workplace, in any organization, you have to embrace teamwork. Teamwork is so key these days. We are working with such huge challenges and huge problems that require not that one person who's going to be a genius, who's going to know. You have to collaborate and work with others to come up with solutions. And if you do not get that, if you do not embrace collaboration, it becomes very difficult. And I did not do that. You know, I used the formula that I was using at university. It did not work until I realized that I needed to change. The problem was not all of the white managers that were there. No, the problem was me. I had to work on myself. Asking for help. Many of us, you know, come from a situation where you are dependent as a child, you're dependent, go to another level of being independent. I pride myself of being able to do things by myself. You know, I don't need anybody, I can solve the problems, or hey, you enter the, the work space, you enter the work environment, <laughs> you just cannot solve things by yourself. In fact, you have to also admit that you need help and be bold and courageous enough to reach out to people that can help you. And some of those people are people like Nigel, who is sitting here today. The person that I used to reach out to when I arrived at IBM, he had many, many years there. I had no clue about the IT industry at that time. Reach out to people like him, you know, and many others. And that's what I mean. You know, sometimes we're trained to, you know, you have to be a man. You die because you are not asking for help. Of course, embracing diversity, be of service to others, and take initiative. This one was another big one for black people like me. Uh, you trained there, I remember my parents used to say, there's a word in Tosa, I say, yeah, we are the Gaza, you know, meaning it's like it's trying to discourage taking initiative. When you're displaying those, those uh, qualities, like, no, you know, you know don't do it that thing. That's how you, you are programmed. And you come to the workplace, it's like you're sitting there you know, and not asking anything, you're not volunteering, you're not, you're not going to go anywhere. You need to take initiative. And it's something that I learned. You know, very difficult. So that transition, it happens from job to job. One needs to understand what are the things that will make one to be successful in the new environment that you are working with. I'm also going to uh, share a little bit about some of the what I would call conventional wisdoms. We go around carrying what are called mental models in our minds, the things that we don't know that these are the things that are governing us, but these are the things that program us to, to come up with certain decisions. We carry assumptions, but what we do not do is to question whether those assumptions or mental models are still valid. Hmm? We don't do that. 
And with time, they may have been valid years ago, but maybe now they're not valid. So you have to continue to ask yourself some of these questions. What is one of the assumptions uh, or mental model? People say that uh, the customer is always right. You know? When one says that, the customer is always right, it just um, sounds right, isn't it? Sounds right, yeah, the customer is always right. It sounds, yeah. And you operate under that mode that the customer is always right. You are starting up a business, the customer is always right. The customer is not paying you, but the customer is right, <laughs> you know? It cannot be. You need to go and address the situation of the government or this company that is not paying you. Instead of sitting, oh no, I cannot have this discussion because the customer is always right. The customer is right, is telling you, no, for this deal, go and partner with Nyati, whatever, company there. Okay, why, what is it that Nyati is bringing to what I'm bringing to you? You are not asking that question. You go and bring the Nyati company to be part of that. The customer is not right. What is the value that this company is? That's where the corruption starts. It starts from the, us not questioning some of these things. The customer is not right in that instance. He does not know the stuff that you are bringing. He does not know what you need. You go form your own partnerships. You do not have to be told by the customer you know, the kind of partners that you need. Immediately, that they are starting to tell you which partner that you need, there's a red flag there. Why? Why is he or she choosing that particular partner? So my point is we're carrying these, these mental models, we're carrying these assumptions in our heads. You know? uh, sometimes we say, uh, if you look at that one of the the key models there uh, is called the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. I also used to you know, think that, hey, this is the model, until I started to ask myself some deep questions about this model. Mm -hmm. and, and you start to find that there are people who do not fit within that model. Mm -hmm. Maybe people who have outgrown that model. People like Mandela, People like Gandhi, you know, people who, you know, it's not about themselves, it's about others. It's what I call self-transcendence. You go and look at things beyond yourself, you know, beyond self-actualization. So if you are stuck with that, it may have been right, it may have been the view then, you know. So my point is that we, we always need to be questioning some of these things. We need to be questioning the models that uh, we carry in our heads. For me, one of the big things that, uh, that any, as any leader, you have to do, you have to look for the best people, to surround yourself with the best people. See that the president has tried to do that. <laughs> he has tried to do that. Too. I would say in the main, he has achieved some of that. Maybe three quarters, somewhere there. Look, we are not perfect, so yeah, yeah, we will continue to improve. Uh, but he has tried that, and, and that's good, and we need to be, ha we'll be happy with that step. But overall, we really do need to surround ourselves with people who are better than us. We always talk about these things, but we don't do it. Why? Because we are not so sure of ourselves. You know, we are uncomfortable. We have to learn to surround ourselves with it. That's what we have done in, in Altron. And over the last, I would say, 11 months, uh, we've brought in some very, very good people. Each one of those people, I can safely say, each one of those people are better than me in the areas, in their areas of focus. Because immediately that I know more than you, in your area, we have a problem. We are going to have a big problem. You need to know more than me. So I have surrounded myself 
even the people that are left behind, there are new, there are old people that are still part of our exco, who are found within Altron. The people that are there, those are the best people for those roles. That's why they are part of the exco, and that's why we start to find wonder why. Why does this guy look like he's got a magic when he goes to an environment, uh, things turn around? There is no magic. The magic is to make sure that you surround yourself with the best people, people who question you, people who challenge you. And that is key. So that I've, I've tried to do that. It's not the easiest of things. To manage smart people is not, it's not easy. It's not forever challenging you but you learn in the process. You learn so much. The other thing is, you see that there are no courses there. <laughs> I come from the Eastern Cape. There's no courses there. You choose people who are different from you. I'm not saying that if I find a Kosa person who is great, I won't hire that person. But I'm just saying that you, by design, you look for people who are different from you, because those people will bring something different, will make the whole discussion, the whole approach much, much more productive and help us to address the big challenges that we face. Our challenges require us to look at things from different angles. And if you all have Tosa men around you, all thinking around the same way, coming from a poverty of the Eastern Cape, is going to be a problem. <laughs> Many of us, uh, this is something that we do not do uh, a lot. It's uh, ask yourself, who are my stakeholders? Wherever you are, you know, you may have a small business. Who are my key stakeholders? and proactively manage those stakeholders. In, in my situation, uh, we find that uh, the government of South Africa is one of the key stakeholders. And I cannot outsource that relationship, building that relationship with key people. I cannot say, no, it has to be done by, I need to be part and parcel of managing those connections. Connections with customers, employees, key stakeholders, mm? our business partners the communities. These are stakeholders that we all you need to consciously manage. If you are working for a company, your boss is one of those stakeholders. You better understand what is it that he expects and wants. Very important. Otherwise, you are not going to have uh, too much increase and in promotion. <laughs> So managing of, of, of stakeholders is something that, that really differentiates many, many brands. You know, there are many brands, all of us have got brands, but the brands that stand out are the brands that consciously manage these relationships. In particular, the relationships around the communities where they work. Because ultimately, we need to uplift communities. We need to make sure that we serve those communities. We need to align with the priorities of government. Most of the time, you know, you see there we've been getting a lot of awards and sometimes we get lost. You get lost in all of this praise, recognition and all of this. And you forget truly who the people are that make us to be able to represent our companies and get these awards. The people that make the difference is the people, it's our staff, it's our employees. And these are the people who always give back that recognition because it is them, they are the ones that have made uh, the changes that makes us to be winning companies or winning organizations. So for me, uh, look, I've been blessed, you know, most of the organizations that I've worked for, is, uh, you know, we have been able to do great things, uh, but the key focus, if we to look, that is the common thread, the common thread is the focus on people. Focusing on people and making sure that you create an environment where they bring their best game to work. You try, you know, you can always try, not, maybe not 100% every day, but at least you try to create that environment. 
Okay. Self-awareness. We, we, we really need to focus on this. You know, it's this one thing that uh, all of us need to try and who am I? What are the things that makes me who I am? What do I value? And why do I like the things that I like? <laughs> Those are important questions that, uh, that we should be asking ourselves. You know? So that the more you know about yourself, the more also you know that the, these are the kind of people that I need to bring as part of my team, people who are maybe slightly different or maybe people who share the same values as you. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, that's something that uh, over time I've been able to kind of figure out that uh, yeah, these are some of the things that I believe makes me who I am. Mm -hmm. Family excellence, integrity, uh, again, uh, being born in a family that is divided, that is a benefit, now I love inclusion. Something that is just part of my DNA. Maybe the last point is uh, let's make time to be with the people that uh, we care most. You know, we get lost in all of this, the glory and everything, we forget that uh, we've got families, that uh, if I look at myself, <laughs> uh, you know, most of the time it's so lonely in the jobs that we do. And uh, you know, maybe the person that I speak most to about issues, who is the most objective is my wife. You know? and, uh, and, and, and that is the, that's the time that I, I value, you know? because he will, she will give me the feedback. You know? uh, at work, Maybe people just, you know, try and tell me what I need to hear. <laughs> My wife does not care about that. <laughs> she tells me that, you know, you are not doing the right thing here. You know. And, and we, need to, we need to make time to be with the people that... Uh, if I look at, at maybe the thing that uh, have helped me throughout, it is that focus, very much focus on my family. So with that, I will stop there and uh, open it up for Q&A.